to the fourth episode of the journey. Today in conversation, we have a Bangalore based historian, Dr. Vikram Sampath. Dr. Vikram Sampath is a man with many introductions. He is an engineer by training, a mathematician, um, a musician, historian, obviously, and an author of three books. Uh, Dr. Sampath, welcome to our channel and uh, thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhra Saji. Always a so, pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> so uh, the viewers of the show would know that it is uh, the 137th birth anniversary of uh, Veer Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. And uh, Vikramji has written, the, the, his latest book is an amazing biography of the Savarkar. It's in two volumes and this is the first volume that uh, we have with us. And uh, he's still working on the second volume and hopefully we'll have uh, that copy very soon. Um, the book gained a lot of critical acclaim. Uh, uh, Dr. Sampath was in conversation with many media, media houses over some sections of the book which were uh, considered controversial. And uh, today, we'll, we shall try and unpack uh, the historian in uh, uh, Dr. Sampath and also try and look at various aspects of Savarkar's life that is very, very contextual in the contemporary discourse. Dr. Sampath, before we begin, I would want to ask you that uh, Savarkar has been relegated to two ideological straitjackets. On the one hand, he's seen as a Hindutva icon, somebody who built up uh, an identity-based uh, political discourse around the term in a cultural national context of the then British India. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, we have Savarkar being slotted in the category of a revolutionary who ultimately cowed out to the wishes of the British government. As a historian, how do you see the man? Do you see him fitting into these two molds or was he beyond uh, these straight jackets? I think that's a great way to begin. And uh, my biggest fascination for Savarkar was that, that it was impossible to actually pigeonhole him into any of these definitions, you know, straight jackets that we have, uh, and a, really a historian's enigma, so to say, because there's so many, so many multiple shades to his character, and he was a man of contradictions. And that was uh, evident in almost all aspects of his personality. Uh, as you mentioned, a revolutionary, but also someone, you know, someone who was, uh, on the one hand, getting bomb manuals, uh, you know, cyclo styled and uh, copies of it made and sent to India for bombings in different parts of uh, the country, political assassinations and so on. At the same time, someone who was a sensitive poet, uh, whose heart uh, overflew with emotions when he went to the Brighton, uh, you know, at, at the, the seaside in Brighton in uh, UK. Uh, and he composes that famous Sagara Pran Tadamadala, uh, my uh, Atma is all the time in a state of flux, uh, being separated from my motherland. So uh, someone who was a fiery orator, uh, someone who was a great uh, thinker, a, a, a poet, as I already mentioned, also someone who was a playwright, uh, an ideologue, at the same time, a very introverted kind of a person who kept a, a very guarded, um, you know, uh, was very guarded about his own personal life and didn't let too many people inside. Uh, an atheist, or atheist is a wrong term. I think we should use the word Nirish Parvad uh, because atheist doesn't probably is the English translation of Nirish Parvad. Uh, and an anti-ritual kind of a person. But at the same time, somebody who was the wo most vocal spokesperson of the Hindu community uh, in those very tumultuous decades leading up to uh, independence and partition. So to pack someone who, uh, with so many multiple contradictions and there too, I mean, when you spoke about revolutionary, the first uh, image that comes to us of a revolutionary is somebody who's associated with uh, Marxism. Uh, but here was a revolutionary who actually, and thankfully so, did not draw much uh, uh, or any inspiration from Karl Marx, but his source of inspiration were the Italian revolutionaries, uh, Mazzini and Garibaldi and all of them. And their whole model of young Italy that they had of Gal mobilizing and galvanizing the youth uh, to fight for the freedom of their country was what was being replicated uh, by Savarkar through his experiments uh, in different parts of Maharashtra with the formation of the Mitra Mela, the Abhinav Bharat, the Rashtra Bhakta Samoha, different names of the same, the first secret society, first ever organized secret society that was formed in India uh, under his leadership. So, so many different facets to his personality, most of which, uh, you know, have remained unknown 
or I think consciously suppressed uh, in the last 70 years for various political reasons, which of course I'm sure you will quiz me on. But uh, uh, so I think it was it was these multiple shades of his personality which prevent him from being, as I mentioned, uh, stereotyped into one particular definition. That's what actually attracted me to him uh, in the first place, that this man needed a re-evaluation and every i think history uh, is a discipline which is not static and you need to keep re-looking re-evaluating historical uh, uh, you know events as well as characters in the wake of new evidence in the wake of new generations which look back upon the same history and re-evaluate them and savarkar somehow had escaped that re-evaluation uh, re in my view um, an objective assessment of his contribution to the country and its freedom struggle when, as a historian, you approach a person like Savarkar and his entire uh, body of work and whatever he stood for, how much does the activist in you takes over? Um, you, you have been curating uh, you know, literature festivals. You have been curating some amazing cultural festivals of international acclaim. So, of course, there is a shade of activism also. I would say zero. Uh, and I think that is, that is extremely important. Uh, where I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, all these contentious and enigmatic characters, as I said, uh, you know, Savarkar, there are others I've written about, uh, Tipu Sultan in the past, in, as a part of my uh, book on the Vodayars of Mysore. These are shades of grey. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, put these labels of black and white. There's a continuum of multiple, not just 50 shades, I think there are multiple shades of grey when it comes to characters like this. And if we put on ideological glasses and we have to face it honestly. Every historian is also, uh, um, you know, living in the same society. So uh, there, there do come inherent biases. There, there is an ideological tint in everyone uh, or a political belief. It's just so difficult to be completely, uh, you know, independent and objective. And if, if somebody claims to be that, I think it's, uh, it's bunkum. But then to the largest extent possible, I think one must also present uh, both sides of the spectrum. So, uh, which I've tried to do, uh, and I continue to in the second volume of this book as well, that uh, while Savarkar had all these positives, uh, I, I would also critically assess him uh, for his failings, which he, he should and would have if he was a human being uh, and not a godly figure with no blemishes at all, which is unfortunately what I think many biographers have made of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, where he's beyond uh, any uh, you know kind of uh, criticism and anything that is done to him is seen as maybe hindu uh, chauvinism or uh, uh, you know being revisionist and all that but i think that need to to assess these people and uh, honestly a historian is not a judge in a court uh, it's just the documents that are speaking and as i said these documents can change the narrative 20 years from now where something I've been talking for so long can completely be overturned and changed by some new discovery that might come about. So uh, without being a judge, it's, 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 uh, it's a good practice to put documents as they are uh, to the largest extent possible and limit the interpretation and the analysis, uh, uh, I would say, to a large extent, uh, where you let the discerning reader also make up uh, her mind about what uh, she wants to uh, take away from, from, from the book or the narrative. Absolutely. And I think your book uh, does uh, complement the opinion that you uh, just shared with us. I think it quote, copiously quotes from Savarkar's own works, uh, yeah. different writings that he has done over a, over a, a considerable period of time. Um, what do you think were the shortcomings of Savarkar? And I ask this uh, not just as a historian, but as somebody who would, who would perhaps have wanted to see India in, an, in, a, in, in a different light. When the freedom struggle was going on, Savarkar was an active revolutionary and he had a particular thought process with respect to who should actually form the idea of Bharat and so on and so forth. Do you find some kind of a, a disagreement with his philosophy somewhere? Uh, as I said, you know, I mean, my agreement or disagreement with him as an individual, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a nobody to, uh, to articulate. As a historian. Yeah, <laughs> no, even as a historian, uh, it's, it's uh, so that assessment, uh, so to say, uh, in as many words, I think it becomes a little problematic because then it's a very subjective assessment that I make. But then the I, I would rather weave the narrative in such a way that anyone who's reading uh, uh, the, the story himself or herself gets 
the clue that this is where probably the Congress faulted or this is where Savarkar could have done something better. Uh, rather than me imposing that just because I have the power of the pen and the, uh, the privilege uh, of committing that to print, uh, whereas it, someone else is not. And these are dead people who are not there to defend themselves. So uh, I, I think it's highly unfair for a historian to do that sort of criticism because I think like we were discussing the other day, uh, we all today have that privilege of sitting uh, literally in this air-conditioned room and making these retrospective assessments of people. Uh, they could have done that. They might have uh, done this and that might have happened. So you have these uh, repeated things, um, uh, you know, if and when conjectures that people do. If Vallabhai Patel was the prime minister, then the Kashmir issue might not have happened. In my book launch, Mr. Uddhav Thakre said, if Savarkar was the prime minister, then uh, uh, Pakistan itself would not have existed. Now, these are all, I mean, it's like um, tarot card reading. I mean, we don't know, right? I mean, if uh, who might have, what might have. It's a waste of time to even get there because uh, that's not what happened. And uh, we better document what actually happened. So to your question, which is important, and uh, since I'm not a hagiographer of Savarkar, but a biographer who's tried to stick to the facts, uh, what were his shortcomings? Uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, I must qualify here that uh, the man is already beaten so much by his uh, uh, opponents that me adding further fuel to that fire of uh, listing his shortcomings, uh, I don't know whether it's very opportune. But then, yeah, since you've asked, I think I must say that um, to a large extent, I, I I thought, and I don't articulate it in as many words, I let the reader make up that uh, decision. Someone may not make up that uh, decision. So this is a very subjective judgment I have made that this is what it is. But you may not think so. You may have a different perspective to uh, the evolution of his life's uh, journey. Uh, so despite you know having such progressive and modern views, why is it that uh, he did not manage to get a mass following uh, like Gandhi? Uh, did. Why is it that he did not manage to inspire even the Hindu uh, community to the extent that he should have, um, you know, and made it a potent political force, particularly in the face of, uh, you know, political Islam that was, uh, that was threatening and finally succeeded to vivisect uh, this country. Um, there, I think there are shortcomings where which could be, you know, multiple. And th that's where the subjectivity comes, where I, if I list one, two, three, these were the shortcomings, someone else may not agree with that. Uh, but then in my view, perhaps it is, uh, it could be his personality type. He didn't cultivate the, those leadership. He didn't probably have that kind of a leadership skill in him, which probably a Gandhi had, uh, to lead everyone, to assimilate everyone, to get even people who differed with him, sometimes not in the best of uh, democratic ways. Uh, he would go on a fast, do these emotional blackmails of people uh, and make them twist their their arms and make them come around. Uh, we know how, uh, you know, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and others who disagreed with him were shown their place in the Congress. So that kind of Machiavellian uh, uh, real politic uh, uh, behind the garb of sainthood uh, was perhaps, uh, I don't know, I'm giving a backhanded compliment to whom I, I don't know, but then maybe all that sort of real politic was missing in this man, which is why uh, he and his protege, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, uh, probably never got along. They should have been the, the Gandhi and Nehru of the Hindu right uh, in those years. But eventually Shama Prasad Mukherjee breaks away and then has differences with him, um, jo joins the interim government of under Nehru and then of course forms the uh, Jansang. So uh, I would say, and, and some of his views too, you know, whether it was uh, on caste on the caste um, uh, system and its dismantlement or uh, touchy issues like um, the worship of the cow and so on. I think they were way uh, ahead of their times. He didn't realize that uh, in, in society, any reforms only need to be incremental, which is what I think Gandhi was trying. And perhaps that is why he uh, succeeded where here was a nihilist who was looking at a dismantling of the entire edifice and a reconstruction uh, of the whole system, which is great. It's good to be a man in a hurry. Uh, but then at the same time, you must realize that society does not accept um, such tectonic shifts and tectonic changes. So one gives zor ka jhatka dheere dheere se lagna chahiye. So maybe that sort of a thing was missing and which is probably why. And again, as I said, this is my assessment. It could be different from someone else's. Uh, why his uh, views, despite all of his proponents praising him to the skies, um, then why did this not gain currency in the India of, uh, of the 1940s? That is, I would say, one of the shortcomings if you 
really insist that I should list out some. The usage of the term shortcomings was exactly to elicit the kind of response that I managed to uh, do with you. Uh, also because uh, Savarkar is one such figure who has uh, not been, um, and for the lack of a better word right now, co-opted or appropriated by any of, uh, of the political polls that we have. Um, mm. There is a certain sense of discomfort on either side of the uh, ideological political spectrum to uh, to accept Savarkar as he was, because as you rightly said, he had very, uh, and I think I would like you to shed some light on the kind of views that he had, which uh, made him uh, strategically naive to a certain extent. Uh, mm. and he just couldn't make, uh, you know, build bridges with uh, the, the stalwarts of, of, of his time. Uh, if, which if he could, would have, then perhaps, as you said, in the luxury of sitting in an air-conditioned room, our history would have been different. <laughs> uh, many of them, like I uh, you know, alluded to, the, to his caste reforms. So his treatise that he wrote in the Ratnagiri uh, prison in 1923, Essentials of Hindutva, which is, I think, what has been uh, the bedrock of Indian politics ever since and continues to, to be the, the ruling ideology, so to say, in large parts of India and the center today. Uh, it, it was uh, contrary to what people think of it being a very exclusive, uh, bigoted kind of an ideology. It was actually an inclusive one which spoke of uh, uh, bringing all people uh, who had this country uh, as their fatherland, not in terms of uh, the, the Nazi uh, yeah, yeah. term, but then of our ancestors, Pitrubhumi, and Punya Bhumi, a holy land, uh, again, not in terms of religion, but uh, in terms of your allegiance of loyalty uh, and worship worthiness of this uh, country. Uh, as a Hindu, again, not by the religion, which he didn't care much about, but through a cultural and a nationalistic identity marker, uh, so to say. So anybody with, of any other religion, he uh, prophesized, could be a part of this construct that he created. Uh, and so obviously the corollary was uh, the first uh, step was to unite a very splintered uh, Hindu community. Now we're talking about the religious uh, you know, community of the Hindus, which was um, divided into so many castes and subcastes. And he put uh, this theory actually into practice. And that was what was very laudable in the 13 years that he was kept under house arrest um, in uh, Ratnagiri in Maharashtra. He was not allowed to go anywhere beyond the realms of Ratnagiri. Uh, by the British government for 13 long years. So using that period, the Jekyll and Hyde in him, the, the, the Hyde part was actually also working uh, silently with revolutionaries and all of that subverting uh, uh, the government. But the, 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 the frontal picture was that of a social reformer, which was done in right earnest. Uh, and there too, um, calling for a complete dismantling of the caste system, the Varnashram Dharma, um, quite in consonance with what Dr. Ambedkar uh, stood for. Uh, and in fact, Ambedkar wrote several letters to him saying, uh, you know, uh, you're, the on, you're the only one who, who's understood that it is the Varnashram uh, system, which is at the root cause of uh, the whole caste problem in this country. Because on, we must remember the other stalwart who was talking about caste uh, amelioration was Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi actually gives these uh, very, uh, you know, weird statements at the same time saying the Varnashram is the bedrock of Hinduism. And if Varnashram is removed, then... Uh, Hinduism will collapse and I don't consider the caste system to be odious and so on. He just wanted untouchability erased and that's why this whole Harijan concept and so on. But he, he really thought that, you know, even he said a Brahmin uh, could, uh, you know, learn the art of a Kshatriya or a Vaishya or a Shudra, but then he should not make a living out of it. So Ambedkar and Gandhi have a lot of ideological tips on this saying, okay, so Ambedkar questions him back saying, uh, I'm a Mahar and my uh, traditional, uh, you know, work was uh, being a scavenger. So I can go to London, I can get my degrees, but according to Gandhi, I cannot make a living out of it. Uh, I have to continue to sweep the uh, floor because that is what my ancestral dharma is, uh, uh, according to the Varanashram. So these four Varanas were giving birth to thousands and thousands of castes. So you cannot remove the castes unless you remove their uh, the, the source of their origin of this uh, malaise. And that is what these two men were talking about. Uh, and there Savarkar was more virulent and it came with Ambedkar, perhaps people still forgave him because he was the uh, aggrieved community which was speaking for this. That is, here was a Chitpavan Brahmin, an upper caste man uh, who was propounding Hindutva on the one side and on the other side saying, 
varnashram doesn't mean anything krishna has not said in the gita that uh, chatur varnam maya shrishtva uh, it is all based on uh, gunas and not any, everyone is born a shudra and then you slowly elevate yourself according to your capability your intellect to the caste which are just a, uh, an index of guna and not by birth so things like this which uh, even today are so problematic intercaste marriage uh, intercaste dining at a time when you know within the brahmin community in maharashtra the deshasthas and the chitpavans would not sit together and eat uh, savarkar was propounding uh, and actually established a, a cafe in ratnagiri where people of all castes and communities sat together and ate uh, you, he actually went to the maharwadas uh, the places where the mahars the bhangis and all of these people stayed and actually um, cleaned the those place the swachh bharat abhiyan that was done at that time cleaned uh, the place helped uh, told them the importance of sanit sanit uh, sanitation and brought uh, the the so called lower caste and the upper caste together there was a untouchable ganapati that was uh, put up there and the priest was actually someone from the bhangi community the lowest in the order and the the brahmin had to go and actually you know bow in front of uh, him and receive the prasad so to get this amount of uh, acceptance where it is so tough even today maybe in large parts of uh, hinterland india uh, to do that then uh, to establish the first temple in this country in 1931 called the patit pavan mandir where people of all castes and communities could uh, uh, go and worship to actually get untouchable uh, and I hate to use this word but it's a historical word but un- so called untouchable children uh, to sit beside the touchable children and study Uh, and actually got success too in that in la- in almost all parts of ratnagiri despite huge amount of protest uh, that came about so you can imagine that someone who uh, you know brings about this kind of earth shaking reforms is not going to be a very popular and liked character so uh, and he himself agrees that a social reformer in the true sense of the word should keep in mind that he or she will never be popular and he he always said that it's for uh, uh, janahita that i do work and not for prashansa uh, i may not get the praise i may be vilified but that's okay as long as there's a larger benefit for uh, the society then i am fine doing what i uh, what i'm doing so i think these then his whole uh, issue of uh, the bovine bovine is not divine which i think raises raises hackles even today uh, you know in uh, contemporary politics and he said the cow is just a useful animal uh, and he writes copious amount on on cow worship so he says he does not consider the cow worthy of worship he says an animal which is sitting in its own excreta you are elevating her to the uh, level of a goddess uh, so that is an insult both to humanity and divinity uh, and you become the god that you worship so if you are uh, going to propitiate a very docile animal then you will also be a docile society and he also quotes historical uh, episodes where the cow had been used as a, a weakness uh, especially in battles when the islamic invasions happened so there were entire batteries of uh, cows that were kept as a shield in armies and the hindu side of the army would not attack the other side uh, only because they were scared that the cow would be killed now he says what was achieved by this uh, you know you lost your country your honor just because you were uh, thinking of worshiping this animal so if you want to worship you worship in your house if you really insist but don't get your beliefs your uh, uh, worship into public uh, you know policy so to say which puts the nation and also the lives of human beings human beings life is much more important than that of an animal now today too if one goes and says this maybe in uh, rural up or maybe bihar from where you come from uh, i'm sure that person will not be taken too lightly and we are now talking about a person who was saying all this in 1925 1928 so you can imagine the kind of social backlash this man would have faced and the non acceptance of his views saying he's acha aadmi hai but then he's highly radical and some parts of him need to be excised and we don't need to accept him and that is precisely why i think you hit the bulls eye where you said appropriation Uh, nobody wants to appropriate him including the so called right wing parties of this country and that is the tragedy and that is why uh, the albatross hangs on him all the time where anybody can uh, accuse him and get away uh, so but then you know the political constituency there is no political constituency for savarkar i want to um, before i let you go i want to understand from you uh, in the conception of uh, hindutva that savarkar had where do indian muslims stand interesting because uh, as i said right at the start i mean his whole idea of 
um, that term Hindu was completely outside uh, that of, uh, you know, religion. So anybody, and he, in fact, uh, th there are questions he asks and he answers it themselves. So he actually uh, uh, says, what, where do we place someone like a sister Nivedita or uh, Annie Besant who were born outside India, who were, uh, this was not their Pitrubhu. So, but then there, it was their Punya Bhu. And so that is why, uh, and probably their contribution to this country uh, was much more than even the indigenous people born here. So we would, he would consider them as Hindus, so to say, culturally and nationalistically. Uh, and in this con con construct, he time and again, as uh, there's an entire uh, book called the Hindu Rashtra Darshan, where these are the compilation of all his speeches as the president of the All India Hindu Mahasabha between 1937 and 42, in all their annual conferences, I think it's elucidated very clearly as to what uh, the, the position and the status of so-called minorities would be in a future Hindu Rashtra. And he says that, you know, in uh, my conception, his conception of a constitution of this free Hindu Rashtra would be one where nobody would be discriminated on the basis of religion, caste, gender, or any uh, differences in the eyes of the law. Uh, no community would get extra privileges just because they are a majority. Uh, at the same time, no one would get extra concessions only because they are a minority, because everybody is the same uh, in front of uh, the law. You can, and the minorities particularly, he, he mentions that they did not even have a ghost of suspicion uh, in their, these are the exact uh, terms he uses, they did not even have a ghost of suspicion in their minds that a Hindu Rashtra would encroach on their religious, cultural, or linguistic rights. And if at all there is ever a threat to that, the state must intervene to ensure that this is removed. Uh, but at the same time, keep your religion to your house. Don't bring it to the streets or to politics, which is what uh, was happening right from the Khilafat movement that Gandhi had launched. Religion had entered politics, not on 6 December 1992, but I think in 1918 with the Khilafat movement, which sowed the seeds of partition of this country. So, uh, and, uh, you know, justice to all appeasement to none which we talk about today i think this was the seeds of that lie here in this hindu rashtra darshan which was looking at an equal uh, equality for all but at the same time uh, since you specifically mentioned indian muslims uh, and there i would also and you also earlier mentioned about uh, dr ambedkar if you look at these two thinkers they it was not and today it's very easy in 2020 to sit and say he was anti muslim this one was pro muslim these tags but I think these people, they were politicians who were reacting to the circumstances uh, in which they operated, the, the political social circumstances. And Ambedkar is perhaps more scathing of uh, the Muslim psyche, so to say, uh, of the times, where he says, as long, and Savarkar also says that in his Hindu Rashtra Darshan speeches, he says, as long as this uh, separatist tendency is there and uh, among a section of the Muslim community, as long as they see uh, uh, or uh, owe an allegiance to the larger Ummah, the brotherhood, uh, the Muslim brotherhood, universal Muslim brotherhood, as long as this concept of Darul Islam and Darul uh, Harab are there, where uh, India is just seen as the uh, field of the infidels, which is waiting to be conquered uh, to the lap of Islam. So long as this is there, national unity is difficult to achieve. And this emotional integration is tough to achieve. So he always kept saying that I oppose those separatistic tendencies among uh, a section of the Muslims. But there are several communities, the Bhoras, the Khojas, and all of these, who do not believe that, who are like Annie Besant and Niverita and others, who consider this land as their Punyabhu and Pitrubhu. Uh, so for them, um, the, the vision of the Hindu Rashtra would be what uh, he articulated, where everybody was equal. And interestingly, he also says, being the uh, you know, utilitarian man that he was, uh, now there's so much of uh, debate that goes on. Should the government actually uh, subsidize uh, Hajj and give, you know, uh, should there be a minority uh, ministry itself in the first place? Should you give all these grants to madrasas and churches? So he says, yeah, the government can give, but there too, it must be a percentage of the tax that that community pays to you. So if the, uh, if the community is actually contributing to nation building, yes, this is uh, our way of uh, incentivizing their, uh, you know, role in uh, nation building. So high, a highly non-emotional, non-sentimental, highly utilitarian, where a nation first kind of a, uh, you know, uh, approach. I think that is what defines Savarkar's religious policy and particularly towards the Muslims. That can be construed all the time in the simplistic way of he was anti-Muslim, he hated them and all of that. But then the idea behind that was that. And if he was anti-Muslim, I would say Ambedkar who said, uh, 
Islam is a closed corporation where uh, it only allows benefits for people of their ilk. And all of Ambedkar's statements in uh, Pakistan, uh, thoughts on Pakistan or the partition of India, which has been very skillfully and willfully, uh, you know, hidden from us by leftist historians over the and politicians over the decades. I think they will they will all run for cover if uh, all the w- words of Ambedkar today are released in the open, uh, because what will you then go and talk in Ambedkar's name in a political rally? You you know you will have nothing to say. So uh, I think that the context in which these people lived, it, there was a time it was a time where a section of the Muslim community led uh, by Jinnah, the Muslim League, and others were. Uh, were the objects of hatred for a lot of people. So there needed to be political voices against them. And these statements against the Muslims as, say, as per, uh, per se were not against the community at large, but against these tendencies among a certain section of that community, which um, I think hold ground to a large extent uh, down the decades. And what they have uh, uh, prophesized uh, does come true when we see what happened in Kashmir, uh, to the Kashmiri Pandits and to uh, various other problems that we've had uh, after independence. So as long as that tendency of separatism, that tendency that we belong, so the, the, we will stand up for uh, Turkey uh, during the Khilafat time, we will go and desecrate an Azad Maidan, uh, you know, uh, monument in Mumbai because the Rohingyas are supposedly, at that time there was not even, uh, it was not even uh, the, the fact, we are going to uh, desecrate property in our country because we feel allegiance and brotherhood to some people somewhere else only based on religious lines, not on humanistic lines, then uh, I think that's a problem when it comes to national unity, sovereignty and integrity, because we are all said and done. We are not, we are living not in porous borders. We are living in, uh, in political confines, political borders. We are surrounded by a dangerous neighborhood and uh, uh, an India first policy, which looks at our nation's integrity, sovereignty and territorial integrity is very, very important to have and not give that away in the garb of, so-called, you know, uh, secularism and generosity. Thank you, Dr. Sampath, for unpeeling those uh, layers from Savarkar's life, his views. This book is highly recommended. It's published by Penguin, and uh, I would urge you to get a copy. Before, uh, before uh, Dr. Sampath comes up with the second volume, and when do we expect that volume to be out, Dr. Sampath? <laughs> I wish it would have been out this year itself, but unfortunately the lockdown has ensured that I have not been able to complete some of the uh, research uh, because travel has been stunted. So hopefully by the middle of next year, uh, next year around this time, I hope that would uh, take care of the rest of Savarkar's life from 1924 to 66, his social reform, his role in the Hindu Mahasabha, his articulation of all of this that I mentioned, you know, what pre-India was, and of course the murky Gandhi uh, murder uh, case and the various layers there, leading of course to his final death in 1966. Thank you, Dr. Simple. Thank you for coming over. Thank you, Ji. Always such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.